Welcome back, guys, to our final video of the 2020 school year. We are going to be taking a look at the art of the second half of the 1900s. So we are starting off looking at architecture. Uh, the first era of architecture that we're about to take a look at is called the Prairie School. Now, the Prairie School was really led by Franklin Lloyd Wright, uh, who was an architect working in the Midwest. Um, a lot of the architects of this era did uh, work in the city of Chicago, and their concerns really uh, were about the idea of rejecting uh, the idea that buildings should be done in any historical style. However, they insisted they should be in harmony with the site that they are being created within. So Franklin Lloyd Wright, the main artist of this era, uh, employed a kind of these complex irregular plans and forms that seem to reflect the abstract shapes of contemporary painting. He used a lot of rectangles, triangles, squares, circles, uh, and they, you know, he also tried to stylize botanical shapes uh, as well. So he used something called cantilever construction to have porches and large terraces or terraces extend from kind of the main section of the structure. So cantilever cantilevers kind of give the impression of forms hovering over open space, and they were held up seemingly by these weightless anchors that were really bolted uh, into the, the the rear end of the cantilever that allowed the portion of of the floor to hang over one open space. Uh, and he was able to do this through the use of, you know, iron and steel construction. So these organic qualities of the materials, the concrete with pet, with like kind of pebbles integrated into, into it, you have sand finished stucco, rough hewn lumber and natural woods were all believed to be the kind of the most beautiful aesthetics you could have. And they want to, he wants to use those to blend in with the natural, uh, natural setting of whatever building he is creating at that time. Now his most famous building uh, is a building you may have seen before in in art history. Let's get this to load. Whoops, skip back too far here. Let's go back. Uh, his most famous building is called Falling Water. And it is actually it's about a six and a half hour drive from where we are today. It's right outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, it was created for a wealthy family who owned a, who owned stores in Pittsburgh. This was kind of their summer home out in the wilderness, uh, and it was built between 1936 and 1939. So right before America enters World War World War Two, and he tried to integrate and literally build a house over. A stream like that's where it gets the name from falling water so uh, it is almost seamlessly coming out of the natural rock that you see uh, you have the, the stones below where the waterfall is that are kind of carried up into the upper portions of the house you have the cantilever construction so you see these tan pieces kind of coming out from the main structure and they're kind of hovering creating these large terraces with gardens and also uh, these large tan balcony areas they're all used uh, through cantilever construction. So the accent here is kind of on the horizontal elements of the building. Uh, a little bit up close here, you see the water coming out from down below. You see the natural stone, the kind of color palette he is using is a lot of natural colors and tones. This is the interior living space. Uh, when Franklin Lloyd Wright created a building, he even created the furniture that went inside. He wanted everything to feel seamless. Um, and you have there the fire with the natural stone, and the, the house almost becomes one with the natural setting. And then all of these, these windows allow the natural light and also the ideas of the, uh, the, the, the woods to come into the interior space. So that, that, that was what the prairie style was all about. Now, if we shift to Europe at this time, we get something that looks very sterile and very, very modern. And this is called the Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier, uh, and that's the architect Le Corbusier. And this is from 1929, so a little bit earlier than, um, than Falling Water. We have steel and reinforced concrete is what this building is made out of. It's almost like a box-like contraption. So what you have is it's, it's meant to be a modern house. It's a carport below. You park your cars below it. There's some servant quarters that are down there as well. Uh, the interior has a lot of open and free spaces uh, and there are uh, not a whole lot of walls on the interior. The white symbolizes the modern cleanliness of these buildings um, and how really for the Villa Savoy and Lake Corbusier, all the space is utilized, uh, including the roof, which acts as a patio. And really, 
this is a, a, a place, it's a machine for the living, all right? That's what it is meant to do. Uh, and all the space is utilized. You have these subtle tones. Uh, the white also not just symbolizes cleanliness, but also uh, this new simplicity and healthful living and healthily of it, healthy living. Uh, you have furniture that's also built into the walls, ribbon-like windows around the second floor, and the living spaces are open up uh, into a car courtyard-like setting on the inside almost. So let's take a look at the interior photos here. We have here one of the interior photos again the uh, the the ribbon like windows that's the uh, roof and you can see the terrace up there uh, with the plants you can see the carport down below uh, this is this is from the bottom floor if you were to go up but very stark very plain uh, and now onto another piece of architecture. So this is a little bit different. This is the international style, um, and the international style also goes along with uh, with the Villa Savoy. I forgot to mention that. But with the international style, it's really that buildings were machines for the living, and that sums up really the Villa Savoy and then the building that we're about to look at here, which is the Seagram Building, which was originally created for Seagram's. Um, uh, gin as well as the Seagram Beverage Company. This was their kind of home headquarters in New York City. So it was created by uh, two American immigrants, Philip Johnson, all right, and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. And this was built from 19... Um, I have up there 1954 to 1958. And it's a steel frame with a glass curtain uh, a glass curtain wall as well as the use of bronze so it's set really on this very wide large plaza if you were to go visit it today that is balanced on either side by these large reflecting pools and the bronze veneer gives the skyscraper almost this monolithic large imposing look and a lot of international uh, style buildings are kind of imposing it also shows kind of and represents the kind of the monolith of corporate power. This is a very powerful corporation in the 1950s. They're imposing building. It also has some minimalist qualities, just like the Villa Savoy building. Not very decorative, not very ornate, but it is definitely uh, imposing. And it becomes also pretty much the dominant style of architecture in the United States throughout the 1940s and 50s and 60s, the international style. So now talking in about a, another artistic movement called the Harlem Renaissance. So the Harlem Renaissance, you have, may have read uh, some of the novels in uh, English class. Uh, if you're in African American studies, you obviously have talked about the Harlem Renaissance. But it is a result of a great uh, migration of African Americans from the South to the North. All right, And many of them will become concentrated in New York City, specifically in the borough of Harlem. So it becomes really the center of black culture in the United States in the 1920s and 30s. And and the themes that the artist and the writers and the playwrights will and the musicians will kind of really play upon is racial pride, civil rights, the influence of and also the influence of slavery on modern culture. Now, the most famous artist that come out of this uh, period is an artist named Jacob Lawrence. And this is panel number 49. It's called The Migration of the Negro. It is a series that shows what it was like for Africans who thought that the North was going to be a much different place than the South was. The South had the Jim Crow laws, uh, and they didn't think in the North that it was going to be as bad. But when many Africans came to the North, they realized and, and experienced just as bad of uh, a deep-seated hate of racism that they did in the South. And well, that's what this image is trying to show, that even though um, there is a migration of, of African Americans from the South to the North, there is that idea of segregation that exists in many Northern states. So this is just one of 60 paintings he did that depict the migration of blacks from the South to the North after World War I. And segregation is really emphasized here by this yellow pole. You have African Americans on the right, um, and then you have white people on the left. And this PowerPoint keeps lagging. So let's wait for it to catch up. So we're going to talk now about some 
artists from the Mexican muralist period. So in the 1920s and 1930s, you had artists like Diego Rivera uh, creating a revival of large-scale fresco paintings that were popular in Mexico in the 1800s. Uh, they promoted uh, social and political messages. The meaning was meant to be easily understood. Uh, there were themes that promoted really the struggle of the labor of, of labor and the working class. So the painting that you would need to know is by Diego Rivera, who was, a, who was also married to Frida Kahlo. It's called The Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in the Alameda Park. Now, uh, Alameda Park is in Mexico City. We have this horror vacui, that, you know, that fear of open space. Every little space here is covered. This is a fresco. It's meant to teach. It's didactic. Uh, it shows three eras here of Mexican history. So you have early American history that is portrayed on the far uh uh, right hand side and then it moves along throughout Mexican history from left to right so it depicts a who's who of Mexican politics culture and leadership um, you have here the ideas of Sor Juana in a nun's habit at the left at left center there is Benito Juarez a five-term president of Mexico in the left at the top you have Emperor Maximilian and Empress Carlota uh, who were representative of the um, imperial period in in Mexican history you have Jose Pizarro an artist and a hero of Rivera, of Rivera. Uh, the artist is also in the center at the age of 10 holding hands with Cantanera which is the idea of death and dreaming of a perfect love all right Kahlo uh, is behind him holding a yin and a yang symbol. So you have uh, Diego Rivera at ten. You have Frida Kahlo. You have the eight, you have the personification of death. So a lot happening here um, in this idea, but it's focusing on a lot of heroes and folk heroes from Mexican history. Now moving on to abstract expressionism. So this is your period in art history in the 40s, really right after World War, World War II is over in the early 50s. It, uh, New York City is the center of now avant-garde art, our cutting-edge art. Uh, you have action painting, so a lot of uh, flurry or very quick movements in this is where you get Jackson Pollock. There's no reference usually to a visual reality. If so, it's very abstract. Images result uh, are a result of the creative process. Gestural abstraction is Pollock, and then chromatic abstraction is Rothko. That's the color theory. So I have Pollock in here just because I wanted to sh to talk about him, even though he's not in the 250. But a lot of people always think, oh, this is that splatter technique that anybody could do. But really, this is meant to be um, focused on the concept. So this is what Pollock thought in his mind. If you were to think about his his thoughts racing back and forth, back and forth, this is what that was meant to capture. Um, and it was him oftentimes uh, planning out how he was going to drip this paint. Um, some of it was through the paint can, some of it was off of his paintbrush onto the canvas. And these are usually very, very large. Uh, I'm talking about like the size of my entire whiteboard is the size really of a lot of Pollock paintings. Um, there's no foreground, no background, no depth. It is literally just the concept of the racing moments of, in his mind. But the piece that you do have to know does have some figural uh, aspects to it. This is called Women Number no. 1, 1950, Oil on Canvas by William de Kooning, uh, an American immigrant. You see this kind of ferocious woman with this great fierce teeth and, and, and eyes. She's got these large breasts that satirize women uh, who appear in magazines. The smile is influenced by a cigarette ad, and you have this blank frozen kind of grin which almost makes it look like it is uh, uh, something out of the prehistoric time period or even a horror movie you have the combination though of stereotypes here it's this comment on you know the banal artificial world of film and advertising as well um, you know does she, is she aggressive is she not aggressive it appears aggressive with these brush strokes that are so thick and furious um, and you know is she aggressive or have aggressions been committed against her or both maybe you don't really know what de Kooning's uh, true point is here. And it's also influenced by everything from the Venus sculptures uh, from the Paleolithic period to the modern pinup girl of the 1950s and 1940s. And de Kooning uh, is said to have had a very strained relationship with women. He had a very bad relationship with his mother. He was divorced several times. So he may be taking his aggression on women out in this painting, which is kind of what I would think. Now on to pop art. Uh, so pop art is uh, very much a, a, a 
it comes from Dadaism of the 1920s. Pop art existed in the 50s and 60s. You know, Andy Warhol is the most famous. Uh, the United States is the leader in pop art. And really, the meaning behind pop art is they are images that are drawn from pop culture. They glorify the kind of the ideas of the commonplace, and they bring the viewer face to face with everyday reality. You know, something that's created as an advertisement is it art? They're saying it is. All right, so it's all about that concept as well. The average person can understand pop art. That's often why it's it's popular, uh, and generally thought that pop art was a reaction against abstract expressionism. So Pollock and de Kooning didn't show the real world, and a lot of times in pop art, you do really have human, realistic human figures. And the piece that you have to know for the pop art section is one by uh, Andy Andy Warhol, one of the most famous of all the pop artists. And this is called the Maryland Diptych because it's two pieces uh, from 1962. It's created really right only a couple of months after she dies. It is oil, acrylic on silk screen and canvas. So Marilyn Monroe's face appears sequentially as if on a roll of film. Remember, she's a movie star. Um, she, there's 50 images of her, and they're all coming from a movie called the uh, Niagara from 1953, and it's meant to show the public and private personas. Public on the left, that bright, bright uh, red lipstick, that 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 really bright blonde hair, uh, and then on the right you have this black and gray that represent her private life and also her death, especially the darkest images on there. She had just died two months prior to this image um, being completely finished. And then a sculptural, there is sculptural pop art as well. So Klaus Oldenburg, uh, this is called Lipstick Ascending on Caterpillar Tracks from 1969 to 1974. Uh, it was installed originally in 1964. It's eventually moved and kind of repurposed in 1974. Uh, and it's, you know, aluminum and cast resin painted with polyurethane enamel for the lipstick at the top. It's anti-war symbolism. It was originally placed uh, in a on a platform for speakers who were rallying against uh, the Vietnam War. And it was originally placed outside of Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Today it is at Yale University in front of their library. Uh, but it's kind of meant to unite two ideas of gender. So females with the lipstick. Uh, it also has the, the idea of the theme of death because of a, of, a, of a tank. Power, desire, and sensuality is where you get the lipstick coming in from. So it's the united, unification of, of, of also male and female symbolism here. And because male and females were fighting and protesting too, the Vietnam War. All right, so now on to something called color field painting. Now, color field painting is popular in the 60s. It lacks the aggression of Pollock and de Kooning from abstract expressionism, and it relies really on subtle tonal values. So that changing from lights to darks is usually something that you will see. Uh, and there's also a lot of variations of a monochromatic color. So you see solid colors, though, that might be evolving from light to dark on a canvas is really what color field painting is meant to represent. And Helen Frankenthaler uh, creates this painting here, The Bay, from 1963, which is acrylic on canvas. And it's, the, it's a use of a landscape as a starting point um, of a basis for imagery in her work. She, that's what she normally used, uh, landscape. So painted directly onto an unprimed canvas, which it, it absorbs the paint more directly with the canvas hasn't been primed. Um, and what you see here, it's meant to kind of look kind of like land at the bottom and a bay uh, area in the middle. And that's what she kind of used as her, her basis for the creation of her images. So we're gonna we're getting close to the end here, and we're gonna take a look at two pieces of art, or one piece of art that's considered a happening. And happenings began in the 1950s, and they were usually performance pieces, and they're usually planned out, but they also involve also involve some spontane spontaneity, some improvision, um, and some audience participation. And the lady that we have to know is a lady that is still alive today. Uh, her name is Yoai Kasami, uh, and her really first famous piece of art was called Narcissus Gardens. Uh, it was first seen in 1966 in Venice, uh, and really it consists of mirror balls. And she's Japanese-born, The works uh, she works in a wide variety of media. She still creates art today, 
uh, originally was meant as a non-participant. You weren't really supposed to interact with these narcissist balls, but what they were is she had 1,500 large mirrored stainless steel balls placed on a lawn that said, your narcissism is for sale. And the balls were reflective and you would see yourself in it. So they were for sale as commentary on the, the commercialism and vanity of the current art world. And the balls later got moved to water to make even a stronger connection to the story of Narcissus. Because remember, he looks into the, the fountain and he sees his face. So that's why she places them um, uh, eventually in water as well. So on to some more art here. We're going to talk a little bit about... Got to go back here. Some site art. Now, site art is really often called earth art. And earth art um, was starts as a kind of a catalyst during the environmental movement of the 1970s. It often needs to be left intact. It needs to be fully understood. Uh, then one of the most famous pieces of site art we've looked at so far was the Serpent Mound, right? So uh, the now the piece that you need to know is something called the Spiral Jetty. This is out in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Uh, it was site-specific. Its design uh, reflects the, the surrounding area, the rocks that were that were created, uh, and it was meant to be seen in its original location. And art, you know, art here does not have a, a museum. You have this coil of rock growing in part out of the Great Log Salt Lake that is an extremely remote and in, in, in a very inaccessible area. The artist liked the blood red color of the water, which was due to the kind of the presence of bacteria and algae that live in this area. And, you know, a jetty is usually kind of a pier that extends into the water. Here it is transformed into this curl of rocks sit, or rocks that are sitting silently in this vast emptiness of wilderness. And you are able to walk out there, but in certain times of the year, Year, it is you're unable to actually uh, to see it because the water uh, level is too high. All right, so now into our final piece uh, or our final actual uh, era of art history is postmodern architecture. Postmodern architecture, for the most part, is varied. It's meant to be interesting, complex, and also eclectic. So this is post-international style. Now, the piece that you have to know is actually a home. Uh, it's called the House in Newcastle, Delaware. In Newcastle County, Delaware. It's in Delaware, so it's not far. It is designed by Robert Venturi. It's also known as the Robert Venturi House. Uh, John Reich and Denise Scott. Denise Scott Brown, and it was designed between 1978 and 1983. It's wood frame and stucco. It's designed for a family of three. Uh, the wife was a musician, hence this music room that I have here on the right that has two pianos and an organ and a harpsichord. Her husband was a bird watcher, which is why they have large windows. And you have a mixing of historical styles. Uh, Venturi thought that, you know, less is a bore, which is a critique on the international style, which is very, very, very minimal. Here, though, in postmodern, you have a lot of styles all coming together to create the look that is being achieved. And that's what we have here. Uh, the columns are actually flat rather than the traditional round kind of columns that we're usually known for. Drained pipes uh, at the left bisect the outermost column. So that's something a little bit different than what we've seen before um, in any other pieces of architecture. And this is our final piece. Hopefully you guys uh, are going to be successful next Friday on your art history exam. And don't forget to make sure that you take notes on anything in red. And I will talk to you guys next time.